Hi there, I'm Trip Lanier. I'm a men's coach. I host the New Man Podcast. And I've been coaching for almost 10 years now, and I've been a student of what really matters and what really works for quite a bit longer than that. Uh, today, I want to share with you some big ideas, mainly around this concept of how to, how to stop playing small. And what I mean by that is it's not about uh, playing big, meaning like big money, big cars, big extravagant things in our life. What I mean by playing small versus playing big is, are we living from a place of fear? Are we living from a place of scarcity? Or what, how do I make sure I don't lose something? Or are we playing in service of what we really want to experience in this life? So a lot of the things that I'm gonna be talking about today are the myths or the limiting beliefs that I encounter with clients and I'm not gonna bullshit you here. These are the limiting beliefs that I continue to keep an eye on. These are the things that, that wanna get into my head and keep me from playing big in my life. So this is gonna be here to help me and hopefully it's gonna help you too. So let's dive in. Number one, committing to your vision is a trap. Yes, committing to your vision is a trap and I can hear coaches all across the land going, what do you mean? Visions are the big deal, this is what we do. The myth here is that I'm stuck. This is the type of thing we play in our head. I'm stuck because I can't figure out what I really want to do. And I won't commit to anything and stick to it. So those are the types of things that show up in our head when this is happening. Now, I spent years feeling stuck. I was transitioning from my previous business into becoming a coach, and I was resisting this. I had one foot in. I had one foot out. I was stuck in this analysis paralysis, and it was really, really painful. And that what was happening was that I was trying to predict the future. I was, I was trying to scan and, and like, what's the thing I should do that will work? I wanted a foolproof plan. I wanted a foolproof vision. And I was stuck in this like waiting uh, area, trying, you know, waiting for this to appear. And that was what was really, really, really painful. So I, I, there's an illusion here that we can figure out what the perfect thing is. We, there's an illusion that we're going to be able to forecast what we're going to want and what is going to be available to us in the future. And we just can't do that. Uh, trying to predict the future is painful. Trying to come up with a vision or a plan that will suit the future is really painful because it's always changing. Everything is, is in constant flux and everything is uncertain. So instead, I want you to consider that what we most want are some key experiences. When I talk to a guy and he says, I don't know what I want to do, I don't know this job or whether this is the girl for my marriage or whatever, it, I always say, well, I, I do believe that you do know what you want. You want some certain experiences and I call them the big four. And you're going to hear a lot about them today. The first one is just passionate. We want to feel alive. We want to feel engaged. We want to feel challenged. We also want to feel peace of mind. We want the sense that life, our life is aligned with what we truly care about. We also want a sense of freedom. We want the ability to say what we believe, to do what we want to do, to be able to express ourselves in any way. And then we also want to feel love. We want to feel connection. We want to be able to fully love other people and feel that love in return. We want to feel connected. We want to feel seen. We want to feel understood. We want to feel appreciated. So I call this, you can call this fulfillment. You can call it thriving, call it flourishing, whatever you want. But I believe, I've yet, to, I've yet to come across some guy that says, no, I don't want that. I don't want any of that. And so when I hear a guy say, I don't know what I want, I say, well, let's talk about your experiences because you do want these experiences. So all of our visions, all of our theories about where we think we may want to go, the imaginary paths, the imaginary accomplishments, degrees, cars, money, sex, curing cancer, all of these lead to having these desired experiences. In our mind, we are connecting the dots, unconsciously or consciously, that these, whatever the path is, is gonna help us have these experiences. So we can let go of trying to predict the future about speculating about what will work then, and then get into the present. It's about coming back into the present moment, getting into our body, let go of the theory, and get into the practice, get into the action. And what I mean by that, we start to ask ourselves, where am I currently experiencing passion, peace, love, and freedom? What can I experiment doing right now that may uh, cultivate or expand those experiences? More and more, we want to focus on what really matters and what really creates these experiences for ourselves.
And what we do through these activities, we start to find out what really works. We start to find out what really makes a difference for us. And so instead of, oh, I'll, I'll figure it out down the road and there'll be this finish line, I'm gonna feel that way. We actually come back to the present moment and say, what works now? What can I expand now? Imagine it's like a, like a little flame and we're gonna slowly add add little fuel, a little bit of air at a time and grow it as we go instead of imagining it's some finish line. It's not something that we're going to achieve at one point and then we're going to feel good. The, 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 the great part about this is that we can let go of the need to predict the future. We can come back to now and we can develop a skill. It's a skill to be able to tap into what really matters and what really works. And come the future, when that when the future becomes the now, you're gonna be a badass at this. You're gonna be able to, you'll have this, this ability to hone in on any given situation, whether it's the, the food you wanna eat, the clothes you wanna wear, the activity you wanna do that day. You'll be able to, to, to tune into what's gonna bring more passion, peace, love, and freedom to you. So the path is going to change, but your commitment, your commitment is to these experiences and that doesn't change. We're gonna run into big problems or we, I, I should say we run into big problems when we let go of the experiences and we make it about the thing. That's how we get trapped in lousy marriages. That's how we get trapped in lousy careers or lousy situations where we commit to the thing or the idea or the vision instead of the experiences we most want to have. If we stay in touch with those experiences, we can let them guide us along the way. We're not going to know quite sure where they're, they're going to lead us. but. That's where we'll always be in touch with those experiences. We'll always be cultivating, always be creating this. And that, and so it's, it's critical. You can't abandon your awareness of these experiences. As I'm talking about this, I'm remembering Steve Jobs. He gave that talk at, uh, I think it was the Stanford commencement. He talks about looking in the rear view mirror and you can't ever imagine that you could, you could see where all these dots are gonna line up. But when you look in the rear view mirror, you see how they all connect together. This is what he's talking about. All right, moving on, number two. Sucking it up makes you weak. Here's the myth, I'm too busy. I can't take the time or the energy to do the things that really feed me physically, energetically, emotionally, or spiritually. I just gotta suck it up and keep going. This is actually kind of noble in our culture. This is more of that finish line mentality. It's saying, once I've done enough, then I'll be able to enjoy myself, to recover, to do what feeds me. And we think that if we take a break, our performance will suffer. And if our performance suffers, we're at risk of losing our job or whatever the thing is. And so this is a fear-based mentality. The cost here is, is we live in a perpetual state of self-deprivation. And if we're depriving ourselves, we're therefore bringing a subpar version of ourselves to our work, our relationships, and our life. But the reality is, when we bring a subpar version of ourselves to the world, it means our performance is also gonna suffer too. So let's come back to those main experiences. What are the practices, the fundamentals that, that actually feed you? What has you feeling more passionate, more peace of mind, more freedom, more love and connection? It's time to put those things first. Think of it this way. If you had to do 500 perfect foot push-ups, and for every lousy push-up it was gonna cost you 50 bucks, what would you do? Would you try to bang them all out? No, you'd be broke. You'd slow down, you'd take breaks, you'd take your time, you'd recover, you'd pay attention to your form, and you'd stay focused. So let's bring that kind of mentality to what every, everything else that we're doing here. The bottom line is, if you're committed to doing your best in anything, then do whatever it takes, including the things that have you rest and recover and rejuvenate, so that you can bring the best self to, so you can bring your best self to the world. Sucking it up and depriving yourself is actually a form of weakness. It's a scarcity mentality. All right, number three, here we go. Choosing high intensity and urgency makes you prey, as in P-R-E-Y, as in a prey animal. And what I mean, by, well, let's start with the myth, okay? To do my best work, I've got to be operating at a high level of intensity. If I stop pushing, I'm gonna fall behind. I have to be constantly striving and moving forward. I have to be constantly productive. I'll find peace of mind once I get all this stuff done. Many of us are addicted to operating at a frantic uh, state of mind or a frantic frequency. We think it makes us better. We think it, it communicates that we care. And maybe urgency makes us feel like our life is important. The belief here is that acting in a frantic way is best. It's most productive. And I think that underneath there is another belief that says if I get all of this done, if I keep all of these balls in the air, then I'll feel safe. I'll feel some sense of peace or relief. It's false. 
This frantic, fear-based, urgency bull stuff is the mindset of a prey animal, P-R-E-Y. It's that twitchy, constantly searching for threats, convinced that something bad is going to happen if we don't answer that email or get back to Facebook or whatever. That mindset is of an animal that gets hunted and eaten. Think about watching the Discovery Channel and those Impalas that are out there and they're like looking around and everything. Yeah, those are the guys that are getting eaten. You are at the top of the food chain. Let's stop acting like your prey. If you're wanting to claim your power, then slow down. If you want to be more effective, slow down. If you want to actually feel more peace and relief, slow down. That peace and relief is in this present moment. It's, that's, this idea is the basis of meditation. It's the basis of the wisdom traditions. None of them say it's out there after you acquire all of this or that. They basically say, shut up, slow down, listen, go inside, be within yourself. Shift from that prey mentality to the hunter. Be the one who is slow, methodical, purposeful. The hunter is not multitasking. He's fully focused. There's nothing wasted. And you gotta let go of that false sense of urgency because it's an illusion. You'll be much happier and much more effective at everything if you just slow down. So train yourself to slow down and relax. Number four, here we go. Knowing what you don't want is not the same as knowing what you do want. Here's the myth. Focusing on problems is what solves problems. Focusing on what's going wrong is being productive. I ask guys what they want a lot, and many of them are stumped. They, uh, I don't know. But if I ask them to tell me what's wrong, they can go on for hours. So if complaining, pointing fingers, and focusing on the problems of the world actually solved them, then our media and our lawmakers would be heroes, and they are not. So simply focusing on our problems does not make our lives better. Problems exist, that's true. The world is not fair. But what makes a difference is when we shift our minds to take responsibility. Meaning, what response am I able to make in this moment? Turn the complaint into a request. For instance, given that this is happening, given that this problem is arising, what choice, what response do I want to make right now? We don't get the, what we don't ask for. And I'm going to say that again. We don't get what we don't ask for. Asking for things, making an effort to change things is risky. And many would rather stay powerless and complain. This is a victim mentality. So let's not go down that road. If you're criticizing, blaming, complaining, then you're not creating what you want. And if you find yourself doing this, then get curious. What do I want in this moment? What can I do to create what I want? What can I create? What's possible? What is within my power right now? Let's move on to number five. It's not our job to take care of you. And this builds on the previous idea. Here's the myth. I'm responsible for other people's happiness and well-being. And if I do a good job, then the world will take care of me because the world is fair. <laughs> it cracks me up. All right, so right off the bat, I wanna recommend a couple of, of, uh, of things for you. David Emerald wrote a great book called The Power of TED, T-E-D, and that T-E-D stands for The Empowerment Dynamic. Go check that out. I did an interview with him on the podcast. Very, very good stuff. And Steve Chandler also talks about this concept in a similar way. He calls it victim versus owner mentality. Both of these guys are, are just doing a great job at explaining this idea, but we're going to take a stab at it now. Many have no idea that they're in what is called the drama triangle with others or even within themselves. Here's the drama triangle in, just in a, in a real high level, broad uh, sense. There's three roles. Obviously, it's a triangle. The first one is the victim. I'm powerless. It's usually the one that's saying, poor me. Poor me that this is happening. Poor me that uh, whatever happened and, and this person said that, blah, 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 blah. The villain. Ooh. The bad guy. It's your boss. It's traffic. It's the government. It's the lousy weather. And then there's the rescuer. Whoever is going to take care of this problem for you, who, whoever you imagine is going to be able to come in and dun, 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 save the day and alleviate this challenge from your life. So this could be uh, winning the lottery. It could be your spouse that's going to supposed to, supposed to come in and figure out that you want sex that day and just deliver it for you. Uh, it could be the government that's supposed to solve whatever problem you're hoping the government's going to uh, uh, help you with. When we don't clarify 
and ask for what we want, when we don't turn a complaint into a request, when we don't take responsibility for our own well-being, we're playing the victim. We've given responsibility for our happiness and well-being to someone else, and this could be our spouse, the weather, our career, the president. Regardless, we're expecting someone else to do something to make us happy. In that case, that person or thing is the rescuer. And if they fail to take care of us or make us happy, then we turn them into the villain. Either way, in this place, we're playing the victim, and that's not good. So this is part of a much, much longer conversation. Check out the, the interview I did with David Emerald and the books I mentioned earlier. Um, but the bottom line, there's no winning in the drama triangle. You don't want to try and be any one of these roles. The only way out is to take responsibility. And we do that by clarifying what we want and taking action. We do that by saying things like, given what's happening right now, what can I do to create the outcome that I want? How can I take responsibility? All right, moving along. Number six. Use your challenges to make you stronger. Mm. Here's the myth. I can outrun my problems and I can design my life to avoid the things that make me uncomfortable. Having problems means I must be doing something wrong. Let's dive in here. So the small mind, we're talking about playing big versus playing small. The small mind believes that having problems means we're doing something wrong. Feeling uncomfortable about something means we're doing something wrong. And sometimes that may be true. But the reality is that what we really want to feel free, to feel peace of mind, to feel love and connection, to feel alive is on the other side of a sweaty conversation or a challenging situation. And it doesn't mean that something's wrong. The small mind is seeking short term relief, short term comfort. What do I have to do right now to make sure that I'm comfortable right now? I don't really, I'm not, I'll, I'll worry about the future later on. It's like kicking the can down the road. I'll deal with that later. I hope maybe it'll, maybe someone will come in and rescue me or rescue the situation or whatever, and it'll magically go away. But if we buy into that, mi that mindset and that mentality, we become powerless. We become victims again. And there's a huge stress and drain of avoiding this thing that, that it even outweighs the challenge of simply facing it head on. I've watched guys have a problem and just keep pushing it off until it turns into this massive thing. When originally it was just a small conversation they could have had that would have been over and done and they would have never had to worry about that, that, that huge problem. So what we want to do is shift into our bigger selves where the focus is on those experiences associated with fulfillment. And when we do that, when we get into that perspective, we start to see our problems and challenges as opportunities. These are opportunities to experience greater passion, peace of mind, love and freedom. Because we understand on the other side of this challenge, on the other side of this sticky thing that's in front of us, we get to have those experiences. This is a growth mindset. We understand that in order to build the muscle we have, uh, in, in, order to, in order to build the muscle, we have to take on, on a challenge. And, and in order, to, we gotta make it work, we gotta make it stretch, we gotta be a little uncomfortable, but when it recovers, we're stronger. So running away from our problems is what makes us weak. Keeping an eye on what we really want, peace, love, freedom, and passion, means we expect to deal with these challenges. We expect them to come up. We expect adversity and uncertainty to show up along the way. These are just bumps in the road. They're not walls. They're opportunities that are gonna make us stronger. Here we go. Number seven, get over yourself. Here's the myth. I'll be, one day I'm gonna be truly satisfied and fulfilled if I have more money, toys, status, uh, attention, recognition, appreciation. I work with a lot of guys who have had the privilege of achieving success, uh, whether it's financial or by accomplishing some really impressive things. And they had a theory, remember this part, we're back to the theory mindset, that if I do X, Y, Z, then I'll feel fulfilled. And maybe they felt this way for a little while. And then they realized that what they want is now meaning, meaning. They throw this word around a lot, meaning. And, and I define meaning to be when our actions, you know, what we love to do, have a positive impact on others too. And this means we have to make another shift in our thinking. We have to go from thinking about ourselves and what I really want and how I look and how I'm performing into it's not really about me anymore. It's about what I can do. It's about what I can serve. It's about what, how I can positively impact things. So we shift from looking for ways to receive more validation through money or women or accomplishments or Facebook likes or whatever to asking, how can I serve? 
how can I make a positive difference to others? One is about performance, as in how good am I? And the other is about service, as in how can I help? One reward is short-lived like junk food. We get a little spike, oh, that feels good, and oh, but now I need more, I need more. And the other is more nourishing. We feel it, we actually feel it feeding us, and it's more sustainable. Focusing on ourselves, our performance, our appearance is exhausting. It leads to suffering. It's in that constant question of, am I good enough? What do I have to do so you accept me or admire me? When these things are all you see and think about, then they eclipse what's really important. In my personal experience, I'm much happier when I get over myself. Life is much more enjoyable when I'm not focused on me and my problem of the day. Relaxing means realizing I'm, you're not that big of a deal. Your problems and your self-interest just aren't that important. And after a bit of resistance from the inside, because man, we really like to feel important, you're gonna, you'll start to find some relief here. And you'll find relief when you get over yourself. So don't take my word for it. I want you to go experiment for yourself. Shift your mentality, shift your mentality from how you can get something from others in the world and into how you can make a contribution. See what happens when you allow yourself to selflessly do things to help other people. See if that feels better than trying to get somebody to kiss your ass. All right. Number eight, chasing goals can make you miserable. Here's another one. This is one of those holy grails of the coaching world, the goals. They love goals. I mean, there are studies that show how powerful practicing gratitude can be uh, and how it can improve our sense of well-being. So why do we resist practicing gratitude? The myth, here's the, the mindset, this limiting belief is if, I, if I'm satisfied with what I have, then I'm going to stagnate. I won't reach my potential. My life will be a waste. I have to stay focused on what's missing and what can be improved, and I have to always be improving. Here's that fear mindset again, that not enough, that scarcity thing. From my coaching experience, I've helped clients create great things in their life and then watch them just move right on to the next thing. There was no real acknowledgement, no real appreciation. They just kept marching forward. They, they like just knocking things down and just keep going. And I noticed that I felt uninspired. I didn't want to help them stay on this hamster wheel. Even these things were cool and impressive. I, I, I noticed that it wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't feel rewarding. The reason why is they were always focused on what was missing and what can be improved. And I realized that what I most wanted to help them do is I wanted to help them experience fulfillment and joy for what they had done. I didn't want to just help them stay on this hamster wheel. So the reality, if we're not able to appreciate what we've already got, this is so big, if we're not able to appreciate what we've already got, we won't appreciate the thing we're currently creating. This comes back to the theory that one day, when I'm finished with X, Y, Z, I'm going to, I'm going to feel a certain way. I'm going to, I'm, then I'll feel free and, and good and at ease. But the brain, we've trained the brain under the circumstance to just focus on the next task. We have to then, so we now, now the shift comes is we have to train the brain to be grateful. We have to train ourselves to the, re, to receive the good fortune we have to actually experience it. And, and we have to learn how to be grateful and also focus on what we want to create. Chip Conley was on my show and he wrote a great book called Emotional Equations. And he says, the trick is to want what you already have while pursuing what you want. It's a both and, it's not either or. Simply chasing what we want leads us to misery. It's never enough. We'll never allow ourselves to truly appreciate it and ourselves and our efforts. We just exhaust ourselves because we've just trained ourselves to see what's missing and what can be improved. So do both. Focus on what you have already. Be grateful for this. And also allow yourself to set your sights on what you want to create. Don't make it an either or scenario. Make it a both and. Number nine, love yourself. Here's a controversial idea. Myth. Here's the myth. One day, after I've achieved this or that, I'll finally feel worthy and complete. This builds upon some of the other ideas that we've discussed, but it goes much, much deeper. I'm talking about our relationship to ourselves here. My friend and coaching client, Kamal Ravikant, wrote a great book called Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It. I, I Just go read this today. Go find it. It's a short book. It's one of the best reads you'll ever have. I, I believe in this book. I don't know how many copies I've bought for other people. Go check it out. But inside, he describes the danger 
of attaching our self-worth and attaching our well-being to the outcome of our achievements or how others see us. Meaning if I don't love myself as I am, then it's up to my achievements and what I do in the world to make me worthy of love. This is a huge trap. I mean, this is poison. This is a, this is a toxic belief. And most of us are walking around with this belief. Most of us are walking around with a voice inside of our head that is constantly criticizing and showing how we're not enough and why we're not worthy for this and that. We're not an ally to ourselves. This is how we set ourselves up to hit the wall. Like, because no matter what we do, it'll never be enough if we don't start from a place of self-love. Loving ourselves, some people really resist this idea. Me too. Like even writing it down sometimes, it's like, ugh. There's, there's something so challenging about it. And I'm, I'm not talking about narcissism. That's actually rooted in another form of self-disgust. I'm not talking about boasting or showboating, nothing like that. I'm just talking about being your own best ally. When we don't love ourselves or appreciate ourselves, when we, aren't, when we aren't an ally to ourselves, life is this roller coaster. The external world is determining our self-worth, up, down, up, down, up, down. But when we love ourselves, when we are our own ally, then we can fail and it'll sting, but the bottom doesn't drop out. Who we are is not defined by what we do. When we do not love ourselves, when we are not whole, the world is a place for us to get something. We're always maneuvering and manipulating and contorting ourselves to fill up this hole inside. It's needy, it's creepy. When we do love ourselves, then the world is a place to give something, to express something. We're here to share, we're here to serve, we're here to contribute. And as I mentioned earlier, this is where we feel our greatest satisfaction. So go read Kamal's book and do the practice for yourself. See how this changes your entire life experience. Big idea number 10, the last one, there is no escape. It sounds, sounds pretty bad, but it's not. Here's the myth. There's always something missing. There has to be some level where I'll be free from this feeling, where there has to be some, some place in life where I'll be free from the discomfort and the uncertainty and the challenges of life. And this pattern of pursuing something, achieving it, and feeling relief for a little while and then feeling like something's missing again, it never ends. Sorry. This is part of being human. This, is, this comes from having a human mind. But suffering comes when we believe that there's some place, there is some way out of this, that there's a, there's a, a magic club with a velvet rope where we can be free from this pattern. Phil Stutz and Barry Michaels wrote a book called The Tools. And Stutz talks about this idea of exoneration we imagine that if we work hard enough, if we do this or that well enough, we make, we make enough money or we can insulate ourselves well enough that then, then we'll be free. We'll be free for good, we'll be done. And here's the deal, there's no exoneration. But many of us are wasting our lives chasing it, pursuing it, acting as if it's real. We tell ourselves that we'll slow down one day We'll relax one day. We'll do what we love and help others. And once we've reached this magical place, this finish line, this winner's circle, but we're never gonna get there because it doesn't exist. So let's stop acting like it does. Here's my advice. Come back to this life that you do have, the one right here in this moment. Allow yourself to slow down right now. Feel your feet on the floor. Feel the breath going in and out of your body. Take a moment to consider that you are part of something so vast and limitless and unimaginable that you are an expression of something that is truly mysterious. Allow yourself to simply have the richness of experiences that are available right now. The people you see today, you may never see them again. It could all be over so quickly. How could you interact with them today as if that were true. One day it will be true. Do you wanna waste this precious time with your head up your ass, consumed by some problem you're gonna forget you had three weeks from now? This moment, this present moment, is your opportunity to tap into something much larger and much deeper than you in this little world of small problems. It's an opportunity to experience the waves of what life has to offer, to feel alive, to feel free, to feel love and connection, to feel a great sense of peace. 
And to also feel the sadness, the disappointment, the confusion, the uncertainty, all of it. Let's stop bullshitting ourselves. Nobody gets out of this alive. So how do you want to live? What will your, you what will you allow your life to be used for? Will you be an expression of something that's much larger than you? Will you contract into a ball of fear and anxiety? Will you step into uncertainty in service of your deeper self? Or will you deny what has you feel most fulfilled in order to satisfy the illusion of safety and control? It's not either or. I go back and forth between these two ideals moment to moment. This is something that is ongoing. But the takeaway here is to remember, remember that we're part of something that is much deeper and profound than our short-term fears. If we can remember this, we'll remember that we also have the choice to open up and step into what we truly want in this lifetime. So this concludes my talk for today. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share some of these big ideas. I hope you, can fi- I hope you find them useful. And I want you to remember that ideas are pretty useless if they don't inspire action. So go find, what, go find a way to experiment with them. Take some small risks and see what works for you. Have fun, stay curious, be playful, be willing to fall down and screw up and get back up and learn from it. Do what you love and help others along the way. Thank you.